Good afternoon, Nubian guys and goddesses. This is Black Living Room Talk. I was reading about the Black Muslims the last time I was able and moving on to the millenarian cults. I hope that you enjoyed the last listening because it was very informative and educational. And it's been quite some time. And I've been very, very, very eager to get back to my readings. And I hope that you enjoy them just as much as I do. So I was getting into the millinery and cults. And it's just one of the other... It's talking about the different groups in great detail who were able to rise up and empower people or organize and organize a people. So the millenary cults are talking about this article is about the Rastafaris of Jamaica. And I want you to know that this is by Philip Mason out of the same volume, The Revolt Against Western Values, Daedalus. I'm not taking anything away from the author. I'm reading it just exactly as he wrote it. So let's get right into this. Millenarian cults. The Rastafaris of Jamaica are one of the non-white protest groups that are not building on an ancient culture of their own, but either constructing from an imaginary past or stealing from another culture. They are not dissimilar to the Negro lodges or fraternities of the South. Combining in one institution their protest against two predicaments, that of the ex-slave in a color-conscious society and that of the unemployed and uneducated urban laborer recently divorced from a rural background. They too search the Old Testament for divine inspiration. Jeremiah chapter 8 and 20 tells them that God is black and that Negro women have been abused by white men. Jacob, the chosen son, was smooth and therefore black. Esau the rejected was red and hairy and thus the first white man. Others believed that the first white man was Gehazi. Gehazi, the leper, white as snow, of Second Kings 5 and 27. Like the black Jews of Harlem, the Rastafaris believe they are descended from Ethiopians. Like the Garveyites, they plan to return to Ethiopia or originally planned, latterly they have become a trifle disillusioned. Their theology is primitive and irrational, but they have the same emotional need as the black Muslims and even James Baldwin. They refuse to accept any longer the values of a society that despises them and are searching for an identity of their own. They seek escape in a community that despises or pretends to despise the lighter skin. The white man in Jamaica sometimes means a well-to-do person who behaves as though he came from Europe and would often not be classed as white in the United States. There is, of course, another target, their own failure and frustration. The cargo cults of the Pacific Islands are also protest movements against a world in which white people have benefits that non-whites lack. They differ, however, from the Rastafaris in ways that are illuminating. The identifying mark of a cargo cult is an expectation of wealth in the form of Western goods coming from overseas in a ship or airplane. This is not exactly rejection of Western values, but it is a hope 
for a simplified, magical escape from intolerable stress. Raymond Firth writes of these cults. They arise as a resultant of several factors in operation together. In operation together, a markedly uneven relation between a system of wants and the means of their satisfaction, a very limited technical knowledge of how to improve conditions, specific blocks or barriers to that improvement by poverty of natural resources or opposed political interest. What constitutes a cult is a systemized series of operations to secure the means of satisfaction by non-technical methods. As in the movements previously discussed, there is usually an anti-European element in the cargo cults, an attempt to be rid of foreign domination, of all the bewilderment and frustration arising from contact with a more technologically developed culture. There are usually features intended to sharpen identification with the group, a flag, a uniform, or a badge. There are, however, wide differences in the degree of reliance on magic among the movements classified as cargo cults. The kinds of protest movement that we have been considering can be illuminated by placing them in a spectrum or on a ladder between two extremes. There would be not one but a number of such ladders. They would range from the use of pure magic to a rational, technical attempt to obtain the ends desired. From the traditionalist to the radical revolutionary, from the need to glorify the group's own past to wholesale borrowing from another culture, the group's own past to wholesale borrowing from another culture, from emotional forms of expression to a quiet withdrawn ritual. The latter is not always a useful metaphor because it has only two ends. Nevertheless, a movement, to be understood, must be given a place within a series of frames of reference. Another such frame is the degree to which a movement's aims emphasize economic, social, political, or spiritual benefits. There are too many such frames of reference for any simple taxonomy to be revealing. A preliminary and fairly clear-cut distinction can, however, be made. Although some movements may engross a person's whole time for many years, they can be entirely excluded from the class of movement presently being considered because they have limited and relatively defined objectives. The Anti-Corn Law League is an example from English history of such a movement. The kinds of protest movement this this discusses may be called protest cults. They aim or expect to change the whole life of their adherents. They believe that certain benefits will follow from these changes. They must, as Raymond Firth says, aim to some extent at achieving their ends by non-technical methods. Moreover, if they are to be truly cults, there must also be a certain spiritual totalitarianism in their arms. The cargo cults differ greatly. In some, the rational element dominates. In others, the magical is predominant. Peter Worsley has suggested that the cargo cults have certain features in common with some African millenarian cults. All of them involve, in varying degrees, rejection of reinterpretation of the Western values that have produced distress. This combines with some break with their traditional past. The cults seek to unite their members under one leadership, even though there are often different groups or tribes represented in the cult. Members must be born again in order to make a new start. Further, they must be committed. There can be no turning back. Commitment may be celebrated by obscene or blasphemous oaths, blasphemous oaths, or ritual. 
Momoa is an obvious example. The obscene practices charged against the Templars had perhaps the same purpose of committing the participants' body and soul to the Brotherhood. A break with the past, apart from its obvious value to a leader in fostering unity and commitment, has a deeper significance. The cult is a protest against a total situation in which two social systems are at variance. It is a protest against both. It is a dissatisfaction with the self as well as with the solution offered from outside. English writers have argued that what used to be called the Indian Mutiny was mainly military than national and that the underlying feeling was reactionary. One of the declared objects, for instance, was to restore the custom of burning widows alive. The motives for this historical emphasis are obvious. Indian writers, for reasons equally obvious, have stressed the wider nature of the rising and, perhaps more doubtfully, its forwardness of outlook. Both have found ample evidence to support their views. The disparity becomes intelligible in the light of the present discussion. The military leaders were in simultaneous protest against the present of which they were themselves a part and a future in which they feared they would be westernized. They restored sati, more because Europeans have forbidden it than because they were fanatical believers in Hindu custom. Indeed, some were Muslim. The mutiny served a double purpose, a defiance of European rule and the joint commitment and something that could not be undone. This was a political rising, not a millenary cult, but it does share other features with the cults. For example, the extremely widespread belief that the bullets of the British and their Punjabi and Gurkha allies would turn to water. The break with the past as well as the future, combined with a sacrificial act of commitment to the cult, can be seen most clearly in a well-known episode in South African history. On the instructions of other prophetess, many sections of the Ikjosha killed all their cattle on the day the New Age was to begin. In several cargo cults, the devotees throw away their money, the soul, if inadequate, if inadequate means available for getting the goods they desire, if inadequate means available for getting the goods they desire. In 1942 in India, seed stores were the first things the peasants destroyed and arising that on the level of explicit utterances the British could rightly define as pro-Japanese. The Indian National Congress could perhaps more profoundly if without much evidence diagnosed the uprising as a result of the stress between nationalism and the imperial power. The literature and the Negro American commonly maintains that the Negro churches have provided the main opportunity for leadership. They have also acted as a means of escape, as an expression of internal solidarity and a means of differentiation against other groups. They have been, in short, the best means the Southern Negro has had of assorting his identity in a form of which he can be proud. For him to reject the Negro churches is to cut himself off from the past. He thus refuses the only source he has had in the past for benefits he is still seeking, declaring it inadequate. He is like the cargo cultist who throws away his money. This is exactly what the black Muslim does when he angrily denounces Christianity as a dead religion of lies and slavery. When he associates the cross with the symbol of a Negro hanged by lynch law. It is, therefore, certainly a mistake to call the black Muslims a nativistic cult, a term that is used of a movement designed to revive or perpetuate selected aspects of a society's culture. Indeed, it seems doubtful whether this term is really of very wide application. The cults and movements considered have all had a dual aspect, protesting against an imposed culture, but seeking a new way out, 
asserting some aspects of the old culture more in defiance of the alien than for any intrinsic worth, but at the same time bitterly repudiating some aspects of the native culture. Worsley has suggested it is normal for a cult to progress from a strong emphasis on magic to a more orthodox political position. The magic of the millenarian cult is almost bound to produce disillusion. When the cult's nature changes or disappears, the whole scene becomes altered. Old beliefs have been shattered, previous assumptions destroyed, former rivalries submerged. It is worth considering, in the light of this trend, certain Pentecostal sects among West Indians living in Britain. These resemble the Negro churches of the Old South more than they do the black Muslims. Far from rejecting Christianity, the Pentecostal sects regard themselves as the only true Christians. They are as puritanical as the Muslims in regard to drinking, smoking, gambling, wearing makeup. They are almost as generous in subscribing to common funds. They too feel they have escaped from a hostile world. They have been born again to find a new self-respect and happiness in a new world. Followers are usually recruited from poor and ignorant people. Those who are attracted who are attracted by the discipline and the fellowship of the sex are not, however, the idle and the improvident. They correspond to the skilled and semi-skilled, serious people who form the backbone of English 19th century non-conformist support for John Bright and Richard Cobden. They reject white society not as white but as non-Christian. Although their psychological and historical background has many affinities with that of the Negro in the southern United States, they have so far found a positive answer to society's rejection. The question is whether their children will reject their answer and turn to bitter protest against what the West has offered. That was The Millenarian Cults by Philip Mason and I am going to be coming back with the new countries. We're going to be talking about the new countries. I hope that you enjoyed the Millenarian Cult section. I wish you peace, love, and light. And I promise it won't be that long this time. Black Living Room Talk. This is the third eye goddess. TBY.